Today is special and it's, it's, it's special because it's Father's Day, but it's also special because um, every day that we live, we have a father who loves us. There's a world out there who, who really has not come into connection with the Heavenly Father. That's really sad. There is a God who loves us more than anyone else. There is a Heavenly Father who knew you before you even thought of Him. And the Bible is really, really clear that this Heavenly Father loves you with a a never-failing and an endless love. And today I want to speak on the Father who will never fail you. And uh, before we do that, I want to say again something, mission. If you're down on mission for Romania in just over a month's time, just to let you know that on June the 28th is the first missions team meeting. You should have already had that date, but I need to just say it. I don't want it to come up on you and then you say, I can't make it. We have 20 people going to Romania this year. Isn't that amazing? That's the biggest team for years and years and years. We have 14 going out by road and we've got another six going out by air and it's just going to be phenomenal. And I was just talking to Anna and talking to some some of the guys in Romania the other day about the missions and how it'll look and it's going to be an immense time. I can just see it. So the 28th of June and the 26th of July, that's the Friday before we travel, by the way, you need to be at those meetings. The Father who will never fail you. Um, As we come into Father's Day today... Um, I I was really touched a couple of days ago by stuff that I read and stuff that I heard. I don't know whether you know, but there are a million children in our nation, a million children in our nation that are growing up in a fatherless situation. When I saw that, that was posted by the BBC this week. When I saw that, I could have wept easily. When I think of that situation, a fatherless generation, the church must rise up and start to pray for the fatherless in our nation. Friday night was pretty much endemic of young people who are searching for something that humanity cannot give them. And I want to say this today on Father's Day, the greatest father you can ever know is not an earthly father, but is your heavenly father. Every good father on earth, no matter how good they are or have been, is a shadow of our heavenly father's goodness. You may have been brought up without a dad today. You may, your father may have left long ago and you may feel empty because of that and you may feel that there is an emptiness. So I wanna tell you, it's not an emptiness that cannot be filled. It's an emptiness that Almighty God can be your father. Jesus said to us, I will not leave you as orphans. But I will send the Holy Spirit into your life so that you can know that you have been adopted fully and you can say with all your heart, Abba, Father, Daddy, who is in heaven. Now that's not just a token gesture. I know loads of children in India, I know children in Romania right now, and God is doing something in their lives that is absolutely incredible. One young lady said to me the other day when I I spoke about this one million uh, fatherless kids in our nation, and and I said that, and, and, and one of the girls said to me, well, that's just life. Some of us turn out okay. And I said to her, some of you turn out more than okay. Many of you are brilliant but you still deserved better. You still deserved better. And my heart also went out for mums who were being fathers. And I thought, how many mums have to do the work of two? Because dads have gone AWOL or whatever it may be, or in some cases are ill, in some cases have actually died. But I I, want to say to you today, Happy Father's Day, because there's a God who is ultimately your father. Maybe you haven't discovered that. Maybe you don't know that, but he, he is your heavenly father. You may not know that the greatest sermon ever preached was preached on a hill. 
we call it the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't much of a mount, but it was a much of a sermon. And Jesus spoke these words, and in three chapters in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 5, 6, and 7, in the middle chapter, we hear Jesus with that great prayer. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. You know, in those three chapters in that amazing sermon, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, that the world has ever received, on the Sermon on the Mount, Father is mentioned 16 times. Within the whole weight of it, in the middle of it, he mentions 11 times, Father, your heavenly Father. Your Father knows that you have need of these things. Your Father this, your Father that. Jesus knew that what people really needed was the security and the foundation of their heavenly Father. We, we, you know we are bereft without that today. We have a nation that has not discovered that their God in heaven is a heavenly Father. Because he's a God in heaven, it's created a perception that is actually wrong. And Jesus came to show us that God is not far away, but the Lord is near to us even in our own heart. Let me show you some perceptions of God today. They're very real perceptions. I come across them all the time. First of all, the perception of God, thank you, the big stick God. I'm not going to ask you if you ever thought of God like this, but when I was a kid, I often thought of, he just looked like that. It wasn't so much the halo I was bothered about, but the pointed finger. He was the big stick God who was ready to catch me out. In fact, God lived to catch me out. That was my perception of God. God was licking his lips just for me to put one foot wrong and to rebuke me and tell me, you should not have been in the cinema last Thursday. And when you were there, you should have paid the entrance fee and not sneaked in. <laughs> if the Lord would have come when you'd have been watching Zorro in black and white, you would not have gone. I could not possibly have left, let you into my eternal home, having cast your eyes on the black and white Zorro. My goodness me, and I really felt that. That was my perception of God. Do you know some people's perception of God today, they believe in God, but they believe in a disciplinarian and a dictator and somebody who's just reveling in a moment to just catch you out and, and tell you you've done something wrong. I want to tell you God is not like that. This is not the God of the New Testament. This is not the God who we serve. This is not the God who we preach. The God who we preach, let me just show you some scriptures from the Word of God on the next slide, please. God is rich in mercy, rich in mercy. God does, loves us so much, so much. He doesn't want any of us to perish. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. He saved us, not because of anything that we had done, but because of all that he had done. Have you got a perception today of a big stick, God? Take the stick away. Take the old crusty image away. Your heavenly Father loves you so much that he gave everything he had for you. Not just for the world. God so loved the world. And we get caught up in that scripture. And it's a great scripture. One of my favorite scriptures in John 3, 16. I was brought up on that. It was like Cowan Gate to me. Spiritual Cowan Gate. But I brought up with that and it was the world. God loved the world. But did he love me? Because it's not very personal, the world. Six billion people, now seven billion people, projected to nine billion people on the planet in 20 years' time. That's not very personal. But the fact is, God loves you and me as an individual. I once heard a preacher say, and it's true, if you were the only person on the planet, God would have sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. How awesome is our Heavenly Father. God knew what would happen at the fall and he had a plan for you and for me. Maybe your perception isn't big stick God. Maybe your perception is something else. Next slide. Uncaring God. 
in me I trust. We often believe in society about a God who is up in heaven. He doesn't really care much. He's not really bothered about what's happening. Um, you know, uh, bad stuff happens to good people, blah, blah, blah. If God loves us so much, why does this happen? Blah, 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 etc., etc. How many times do you hear that? You hear that over and over again. But I want to tell you that there's a God who cares, there's a God who loves, and there's a God who handed this planet to us and we messed up big time. There's a God who cares for us and cares for this planet, but he put us in charge of the planet and he said, this is yours, you manage it, you do what you want with it, bad, good or indifferent, and what did we do with it and what are we doing with it? Uh, that's why bad stuff happens to good people. Do you know, you, you, can, you can have all the triumphalism of, uh, uh, that you like, but the reality is you're living on a cursed earth. This is why people get sick. It's why p things happen. It's why things ha happen to Christians, non-Christians alike. It's why, why bad stuff happens across the world. It's why there's famine, disease, there's war. Do you know why that is? It's not because of God. It's because of us. Our greed, our selfishness, our envy, our lust for power and everything else is all epitomized in misery across the world. But when people turn around and say, Heavenly Father, when people pray and when people seek to give their lives to know God in relationship, you will find that God is caring. You'll find that he starts to intervene. You'll find that God starts to get involved. Even though we're still living on a cursed earth, he begins to reverse the curse. That's what God does. He's not an uncaring God. Next slide, please. Peter says, give all your worries and cares to God. Be Why? Why do that? Because he cares for you. Bible says it's this same God who takes care of, of us. He will supply all our needs. The Sermon in the Mount in chapter 6, right sandwiched in the middle of it, Jesus came to tell us and reveal that our Heavenly Father loves us so much. And then he goes on to say in chapter 7, he says, all the things that you have need of, don't worry. Because Jesus knew that there's always going to be that need, emotional, psychological, uh, uh, financial, economical, commercial, all of those things are needs. We've got all of those needs. But Jesus came and he said a, 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 a truth there that has spanned time and will always be relevant. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his rightness and all the other stuff will be added to you. In other words, get the horse before the cart. If you just do that, I'll take care of the rest for you. Just worship me and put me first and make me centre. And I'll, I'll sort the rest out for you. You won't know, you won't know where it will come from. You know, won't know how, how I will do it, but I will do it. All these things. What, what are these things? These things are relationships, the bank accounts. They're all. They're a ton of stuff. They're even sickness. I said to somebody the other week who was struggling, struggling with illness, and I want to say it again. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the whole aspect and context of illness and sickness. I want to say this again because I believe this 100%. The purpose of God is bigger than any diagnosis and any sickness or any death sentence or any sickness sentence that you may have it hanging over you. If you make God's purpose your purpose, those things will count for nothing in Jesus' name. I can tell you now, I have got story after story after story of actual things that have happened in my life, in my wife's life, that will tell you now I have seen it. There is nothing mightier than the purpose of God in your life. He's not a God who's detached. See what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Well, maybe you say, okay, God, I don't look at God as being the big stick God, the uncaring God, but the image I have of God is the next slide. He's a do-it-yourself fantasy God. He's there for me, and every time I rub the lamp, and because he doesn't do that, I'm kicking my toys out the pram. God is not like that. God doesn't do everything we ask him to do. Hello. He doesn't. I, I meet Christians who think he does. And when I look at their lives, I know he doesn't. <laughs> if, if, if they do everything he asks them to do, then they're not asking for much. 
you know what I'm saying? Read between the lines. Hmm. But, but God is not that fantasy God. He's not a do-it-yourself God. He's not, you, can, you, can, you see, a lot of people make up God in their mind as to how he's going to be and, and all the rest of it. But the Bible reveals God through Jesus Christ so that Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He is the exact representation, says Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. The exact representation of the Father is found in Jesus. You don't have to look anywhere else. It's not like there's a list of gods on the planet, guys. You say, well, there's lots and lots of gods. No, there isn't. How many Mona Lisa's is there? One original. Lots of copies. I want to tell you there's one God, one Jesus, one Lord, one, one faith, one baptism, one truth. The truth in Jesus Christ. You have one Father. You have one Father. Heavenly Father. In that sense. Not two. You have one Heavenly Father. His name is the Lord. And uh, he loves you so much. Look at the other scriptures there. Um, after this, please. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you will ask what you, what you need, what you want. But it's not what you want, it's remaining in him because it's all about relationship. You know the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> you know, when you know him, when you know him, you ask according to his will. When you, and have you ever been one of those, play, these guys, you'll know this. Have you ever been one of those moments where you're asking God for something you know that's just not going to be on the agenda? It's on yours, it's not on his. You ever done that? Don't put your hand up. There'd be too many hands going up. Have you ever done that? You've been like, Lord, Lord, if you can just do this for me, I'll be really good. And if you do that, I'll do this. Yeah, I've done that a lot. Done that. I've been there. I've done that. Sometimes it's work, but sometimes it's backfired. Sometimes it's backfired badly as well. Wow. And, and we can ask away and ask away, but have you ever had the conscious knowledge when you've asked for something, you know you're not asking for something God wants? Have you ever done that? You know, don't you? How do you know? That gut fit, you know, because God's word is abiding in you and you in him. And when you ask for that, you just know, mm -mm, this is off the radar. Hello. This is not good. And you know, sometimes, thank God for his nose. Thank God for his nose. Do you know why you need to thank God for his nose? Because he knows. Thank God for those no's. Do you remember the traffic lights? Thank God for the red light. Stop. No. Close these doors that no one can open. Thank God for that at times. But Jesus says he's asking it shall be given to you. There's a process there of knocking, seeking. It's not a press button, rub the lamp and God will do this and that and the other. It's about relationship. God desires a relationship. Our Heavenly Father wants to relate to us and he wants us to relate to him. That's what the Heavenly Father is all about. Maybe you never related to your earthly father at all well. Maybe he was a complete shambles to you. But your Heavenly Father is so much more better than any example or model you can have here. Maybe your God's not a big stick God. He's not an uncaring God. He's not a, a fantasy God. But maybe he's just plain old, next one please, absent God. And there's a load of people who fit into this context Oh, God, if God's there, why doesn't he say something to me? Are you listening? Is anybody listening? Some people talk that fast and talk that loud. God can't get a word in edgeways. I know you're not like that. It's just me. But the longer you listen the more you hear. It's as simple as that. God sometimes will not shout, but he whispers. And we need to understand that. So dear God, how can I never hear your voice? The scripture says, we've already had this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You say, well, why, 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 why does he have to go first? Why do I have to go first? Draw near to me. Jesus did the first thing. He came from heaven to die for us. He took the initiative for us. 
Now, let us therefore draw near with confidence. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know, the Lord has said, the book of Hebrews is fantastic. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you as orphans. You know, the wonderful thing about the Lord is he is there for you. You just need to call out. I love the fact, and I say it a lot, because it, it's a simple truth, but it really is so great. He is only ever just a prayer away. Thing is, Christians, if you only ever pray when you're in trouble, then you're in trouble. God wants us to speak to him regularly. Praying isn't necessarily kneeling down at the side of your bed. It's not necessarily being prostrate on the floor. I tried that once and fell asleep. <laughs> it's not necessarily saying all those platitudes that sound good in that kind of voice that we like to pray God. You know, sometimes it's just a plain old, God, just help me. Sometimes it's a plain old, God, I'm just so fed up of this situation. God, I'm just, you know, where are you in this? God, show me where you are. Sometimes we just need to say that. And God's, God's just chomping at the bit to hear that sometimes. It's a license for him to get involved. Invite him in, into all of the situations. It's so important. Finally, I want to just say to you now, stand with me a moment. The big thing about God, put that slide up, please. Stop worrying. Your heavenly Father is your Father. He will never, ever fail you. He is faithful. He is constant. He's not going to change with the trends and the fashions. God isn't looking there and saying, oh, I'll just change my wardrobe. And change my mind because, you know, it's a bit, you know, we've got to get with the program. God is constant. He's the same yesterday, today, forever, as he will be, he will be. Everything changes around him. He is the never-changing one. Make him the center today. Father, I pray today that Lord, you will give us grace to accept you as our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for the introduction of the Father, our Heavenly Father, through the Son. Thank you, Lord, that you came as Jesus.